Hello there, and welcome to John's Book Club. Um, it's an audio-only uh, edition this week, because yours truly is down and out with uh, a cold and a fever, and uh, I've actually got the shivers as I record this, and you don't want to see me with my uh, bobbly hat on, my scarf around my neck, and uh, uh, all my jumpers and blankets and things like that. So um, I thought I'd save you, <laughs> save you the... Uh, uh, the eyes, and um, we'll just have an audio edition. This week we're looking at two writers who paint with incredible detail and colour. Uh, interestingly, both these books are from Caribbean writers, and yet they couldn't be more different. Yet they share this ability to kind of, like I say, paint in words and... Um, the quite simple language actually draws you in so that you you feel like you've genuinely met the people and the places mentioned within the, the story and this poem. So the story is by the incredible Jean Rhys and is called Pioneers, O oh Pioneers. And it's from her 1976 short story collection, Sleep It Off Lady. It actually had appeared a little bit earlier, uh, and it was called Dear Mr. Ramage in those days. Let me read the first bit of this story to you. As the two girls were walking up Yellow Hot Market Street, Irene nudged her sister and said, Look at her. They were not far from the market. They could still smell the fish. When Rosalie turned her head, the few white women she saw carried parasols. The black women were barefooted, wore gaily striped turbans and high-waisted dresses. It was still the 19th century. November, 1899. There she goes, said Irene, and there was Mrs Menzies, riding up to her house on the morn for a cool weekend. Good morning, Rosalie said, but Mrs Menzies did not answer. She rode past, clip-clop, clip-clop, in her thick, dark riding habit, brought from England ten years before, balancing a large dripping parcel wrapped in flannel on her knee. It's ice. She wants her drinks cold, said Rosalie. Why can't she have it sent up like everybody else? The black people laugh at her. She ought to be ashamed of herself. I don't see why, Rosalie said obstinately. Oh, you, Irene jeered. You like crazy people. You like Jimmy Longer. And you like old Mama Menzies. You liked Ramage. Nasty, beastly, horrible Ramage. Rosalie said, You cried about him yesterday. Yesterday doesn't count. Mother says we were all hysterical yesterday. By this time they were nearly home, so Rosalie said nothing, but she put her tongue out as they went up the steps into the long, cool gallery. Their father, Dr Cox, was sitting in an armchair with a three-legged table by his side. On the table were his pipe, his tin of tobacco and his glasses. Also, the Times Weekly edition, the Cornhill magazine, the Lancet, and a West Indian newspaper, the Dominican Herald and Leeward Islands Gazette. He was not to be spoken to, as they saw at once, though one was only eleven and the other nine. Dead as a door now, he muttered as they went past him, into the next room, so comfortably full of rocking chairs, a mahogany table, palm leaf fans, a tiger skin rug, family photographs, views of Betsy Coed, and a large picture of wounded soldiers in the snow, Napoleon's retreat from Moscow. The doctor had not noticed his daughters, for he too was thinking about Ramage. He had liked the man, stuck up for him, laughed off his obvious eccentricities, denied point-blank that he was certifiable. All wrong. Ramage, probably a lunatic, was now as dead as a doornail. Nothing to be done. So that's the first uh, page and a half of Pioneers, or oh Pioneers, by Jean Rhys. It's really interesting uh, to consider the time period and obviously this is set in sort of colonial times 
without going into too much so that you can kind of enjoy the story. You know, we're obviously kind of in sort of sort of British colonialism and uh, these people are bored out of their skulls and life has not turned out as as it should be because there's there's no living really going on. Um, and we meet, as the story goes on, Ramage, who seems to have some life. And Rosalie, as a young girl, is kind of in love with this this kind of enigmatic, strange figure. And the story unfolds. You meet all these different characters and you we get to experience kind of how the people of this uh, particular neighbourhood, of this particular street, pass their time and the damage and the effects that that has on other people. Jean Reese herself was uh, born in Dominica and um, came to England when she was 16 years old but didn't fit in at all. She was a third generation Creole. The school she went to, she was mocked and kind of, you know, just left out of everything um, and had a very interesting life, a very hedonistic sort of early life. She was a, a nude model. She um, was a chorus girl. She survived by any means necessary by attaching herself to certain men. She had an affair with Ford, Maddox Ford, who um, encouraged her to write uh, when he saw uh, the, the ability of her descriptive powers. Of course, she's best known for the novel The Wide Sargasso Sea, uh, which is a prequel to, to Jane Eyre. And if you've not read it, I can't recommend uh, a book any more highly than that. Although my favourite book of hers is the, the previous book, Good Morning, Midnight. But um, Wide Sargasso Sea uh, sets the premise that Mrs. Rochester, the mad woman in the attic uh, in Jane Eyre, is up there because she's a person of colour or a mixed race person and is a, a shame to this uh, family. Uh, and so they've just locked her away and it kind of goes from there. Jean Reese always seemed to write from the position of the underdog. A lot of her stories are just real stories with names changed. But as you can see, even from that opening, the descriptive power is so strong and the rest of the story continues in this way. I, I think almost everything she's written is worth reading. Perhaps the first collection of stories that, that Ford edited, by edit, I mean very heavy-handedly, um, come to that last because it possibly is kind of like the weakest thing but it's just her her getting going but uh certainly uh this collection sleep it off lady uh wide sargasso sea and good morning midnight possibly one of the greatest novelists of the 20th century one of the greatest storytellers from uh what we consider the kind of british genre uh of the 20th century but always on the side of the underdog even when the underdog is kind of inverted commas wrong um she's there um and i i'm 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 all with that our poet is derek walcott and this book too was published in 1976 it's from his collection sea grapes and this is the bridge by derek walcott good evening here is the news tonight here in manhattan on a bridge a matter that began two years ago between this man and the woman next to him is ending. And that concludes the news for tonight, except the old news of the river's fairy light and the bridge lit up like postcards, the cliché views, except that they have nothing to grip the bridge with. And across the river, all the offices are on for safety. They are like overtyped carbon, held up to the light with a tear showing. The heart that is girded iron melts. The iron bridge is an empty party, a man a feather. There are too many lights on. It's far too fanciful, that's all. The iron rainbow to the bright water bending. Neither is capable of going. They stand still like beasts in a hunter's moon, silent like beasts, but soon. The woman will sense in her eyes dawn's rain beginning, and the man feel in his muscles the river's startled flowing.
So this poem probably takes a couple of reads, a couple of listens. And just allow yourself, if you can, to not chase after what is this about. It's obvious it's about a man and a woman on a bridge and perhaps their relationship is coming to an end. But we often meet poetry uh, if we're, you know, if we've been brought up in a more literal way or our education has been very literal. Um, what's it about? What does this mean? And what it's about is very obvious. But what's the miracle of Walcott's poem here is the images. I wouldn't say there were even metaphors in a way. They're just images after image after image. He's painting. It's like a, like a painting or a photograph. First of all, we see the bridge and we see the offices and we see these two little characters the life and the difficulty that these two people are going through. And I'm sure that at some point in your life, you've been in this position where something has changed very drastically and you can't move. You just can't move and yet you know you have to move and something enters into the senses. I think it's a masterful poem. With all poetry, if you're reading from a book, allow yourself to read it out loud. One thing we talked about in the group with this was allowing yourself to use the music in the poem. We don't have to force emotion into a poem. The punctuation, the syntactical rhythms, those are there to show us the space and the emotional, emotionality and the layers within the pieces. So just like at the beginning, listen to the music again. Good evening. Here is the news. Tonight, here, in Manhattan, on a bridge, a matter that began two years ago between this man and the woman next to him is ending. And that concludes the news for tonight. It's all in there, you know. It's all in there if we allow the music to kind of play through us. And I think sometimes we just read with our eyes. And it's more important that we read with our whole body. Uh, reading, writing. Writing itself is a physical act. And reading too. It has to register in the body and poetry. This is the great strength of poetry, but also very good prose is, is that if we allow ourselves to read it, sound it out loud with inside ourselves, just like a, a vinyl record, you have to put the needle on the record and then the record plays and the music comes out. A poem or a story very often will unlock much more of itself if we, if we say it aloud to ourselves if we allow ourselves to use the punctuation, because the punctuation is only musical notation. If you think about it, that's genuinely what it is for. The group loved both these pieces. It's not as, not as instant as last week, the Hemingway and the Jackie Kay. Those are very instant pieces. You get them straight away. Uh, but then you go down, down, down into the layers even more. But there's a kind of an instant surface appeal. Both these pieces, the Reese and the Walcott, Take perhaps a little more of our time, but we're worth it. We're worth it as readers to allow ourselves this quality of writing into our lives. The Jean Rhys story has got so much going on in it. It's framed so beautifully, uh, the opening with these two young girls and, um, and their relationship and, their, uh, and Rosalie in particular, her view of the people going on around her. And... Um, and all these textures and and Walcott's poem is is pure texture and it's the texture of of this breakup and we kind of go deeper deeper till we're at the level of the woman's eyes sensing the rain and the man's muscles just kind of starting to feel the river that life perhaps is just moving a little bit in them again even though it's a dread moment and they've no idea how even to take the next breath i hope you uh We'll dig these pieces out and, and really enjoy them. Let me again apologise for not appearing on screen today. I'm perhaps thinking that uh, uh, I'm going to make all the uh, previous uh, soundtracks of all these videos that we've done for the book club available as a, a podcast on iTunes. So when I'm feeling a little bit more with it, uh, if I remember, I will look into that because uh, I think it'd be quite nice if these were downloadable to listen to wherever you are and um, and that kind of idea has come out of doing this as an audio format today so let me wish you really well have a beautiful day uh, 
I'm off to have a lie down and uh, I'll see you next week or hear you or you'll hear from me next week. Something like that. Anyway, take great care of yourself. Bye bye.